It's January. Um, I can't remember if I had just gotten home from school or if it was a day off of school. Yeah, I just remember mom was like, dinner's ready, you know, get your brother, get your dad. And so, you know, I started looking around the house for my dad and he wasn't there. At that point, I just kind of knew something was really wrong. And so I went and looked in the basement. But it was this really kind of crazy in my mind at the time, even it just seemed like slow motion, like opening the door to the basement, then going down the stairs and, you know, turning on the landing and, and seeing him there. Um, you know, after the paramedics came and started dealing with all of that process, you know, I remember just the three of us sitting on the stairs, just like, crying and kind of wailing these like <clears throat> very uh, primal kind of cries and for many many years just until recently I, I couldn't even think about it or go back to that memory but uh, just, it's a very uh, it was a very hard time for everybody ready to go My name, you want my name? <laughs> my name is Catherine McClellan. I am a singer-songwriter from Prince Edward Island. My dad was a songwriter too. His name was Gene McClellan. Now I think we can go back to our musical guests. Here they are with another of those fine compositions of Gene's called Snowbird. The snowbird sings a song he always sings That speaks to me of flowers that will bloom again in spring when I was young, my heart was young then too And anything that it would tell me, that's the thing that I would do But now I feel such emptiness within For the thing that I want most in life's the thing that I can win My dad dropped out of high school in grade 10 and started playing in some of the earliest rock and roll bands in Toronto. He moved to Prince Edward Island in 1964 and started writing original songs when a lot of people were just covering music from south of the border. He was one of the most musical people I've ever met. Snowbird, uh, some 70 people recorded it. And all of a sudden, a young Canadian singer has a, an international hit. Elvis covered his song, Perry Como covered his song. I mean, everybody did his songs. To his dying day, Elvis sang Snowbird and Put Your Hand in the Hand with a 30-voice gospel choir. It's going right to the top. It's going to be another major hit. Put your hand in the hand of the man who still the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calm the sea. Actually, you did pick up quite a lot of uh, different awards and prizes within the last 12 months. You don't keep track of these things very well, do you? No, I'd freak out if I did. <laughs> the hand of the man from Galilee. Putting your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. Oh, yeah. Ah, uh, success. Well, well, be having enough money in your pocket to, you know, see you through the week. Maybe have a beer someplace on the weekend. I don't know. Uh, it was never very much. It still isn't very much. Success, you know. I just want to be completely happy. I, I don't think I ever will be completely happy, but uh, I'd like to have a try at it. P. 
People have always asked me to play my dad's music, but I've been processing a suicide and I, I never felt ready. I can't believe that you're honestly thinking of leaving me Cause I thought that leaving really wasn't even on your mind I'm drowning in tears, drawing constantly nearer to misery I'm just biding my time while the glow from the wine makes a fool of me not all people who are mentally ill are artists and not all artists are mentally ill but you know my dad he struggled with depression all of his life and that um, was just so deep in him and I'd love to learn about him from that perspective because it's something that I struggle with too and, and I don't know where it comes from. There was constant music. If he wasn't making you guys oatmeal in the morning, <laughs> guitar was going. I'd often wake up at two or three o'clock in the morning and I, I could hear him. Well, I was gonna say, I have, that's some, some of my most vivid memories of being a kid, were waking up. The house would be dark, but I could hear him downstairs, and so I'd, I'd go downstairs and there he'd be. And sometimes he'd make me a cup of tea or something, and we'd just sit there, but... Yeah, you used to always tell me that I reminded you of Dad. You look alike. Oh, it's terrible. You look like an old man. No, you don't. You look like the young Jean. Um, I look like a young man. No, you don't. You look like you. And we won't talk about the depression stuff. Why not? Because <laughs> you're like your dad. <laughs> he could be the life of the party. Mm -hmm. And the next day he'd be down in the dumps. The things that he would do, the things, you know, he'd buy, like, seven spring jackets because he'd buy one and then he didn't like it so he'd go get another one and wouldn't return the first one no that's part of the part of it you know it's yeah. like the, these little indications along the way that if you if you're looking close enough that yeah. you know because i remember one christmas he'd be opening up his gifts and no, thank you and putting them down you guys all looked at me i didn't know what to tell you mm -hmm. i didn't know yeah. if i could tell you mm -hmm. You know, I'm the mama bear, I protect you guys, so mm -hmm. I didn't want you to know. Yeah. Maybe you should have known. Hey, how are you? Hi, Benny. Oh. How's your day? Good. Dirt is what I need. Dirt is what I breathe. Dirt. Is what I live on. Generally, these songs are better than the ones I put on records. Yeah, my dad was fortunate in that, um, you know, those songs that he wrote in the 60s allowed him to live the life of a songwriter and he never had another job, which is great, you know, it meant that he was home with us all the time and spent a lot of time driving us around places. going to the orthodontist or whatever. <laughs> but we would just like listen to music or listen to the radio and, and talk about all kinds of stuff. I spent a lot of time driving around with my dad. Okay, you, you pick. <laughs> pick a, I like faces. Jean as well. Faces. Faces. I have seen faces. Raindrops, <laughs> I've seen raindrops. Some of them fell from the sky. Some of them fell from your eyes, though you tried to conceive it. When you're down, you can feel it. Nothing can take it away. Home sweet home. Pepper. Hey. 
see myself. Anyone else is around to see me. It was probably hardest on Catherine more than anybody. She was she was the one who actually found him that day. She went upstairs and she wrote on a scrap piece of paper, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. We used to call her Chatty Kathy, and she was just always talkative, happy and bouncing around, and I guess you could say she went into her shell, probably only really able to express herself through her music. Um, now she's starting to open up outside of her music as well. Like You, you can actually have a conversation with her and, and talk about what happened with Dad and in small doses, but you know. Um... You're in that picture too, Phil. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Dad used to go all out for us. Like he was, he was gone a lot, but when he was around, he was around. Yeah. Yeah, he was a good dad. Philip, I asked Catherine this question, and I don't think I've ever asked you. Mm -hmm. When did you realize that your dad had a problem with depression? I came home and dad was on the bed. He was all curled up in the fetal position and just moaning. And I called Monty and he didn't know what to do for him. And Monty was his best friend at the time, so. Mm -hmm. Well, his mental illness got the better of him. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and just yeah. like crossed a point of no return, yeah. sort of. But I, th I think, I mean, the depression that I've gone through, it's like, <clears throat> it makes you feel like you're a terrible person and yeah. that you're not good enough, and that there's, you know, people are better off without you. Or the Sunday before he died, he told me some stuff, and it was pretty dark, and. What was he saying? Oh, he was saying that the devil told him that he was going to hell. And I said, I said, you're not going to hell. I said, we need you. He said, no, you don't need me. I guess, yeah, at some point, I was probably pretty angry. Um, but it, yeah, I think the shock lasted a long time. <laughs> and then the whole process of grief, you know, it's still happening really. He's been gone for over 20 years now, and I feel a responsibility to celebrate his music. I even started writing a show about his life, but I have so many questions about who he was. I want to get closer. first time I ever sat down and, and really had a jam session with Gene was right here, in, 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 the, in this place here. Davies at the Harbor was well known as, as, as the, the premier bootleg joint in, 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 on Prince Edward Island, certainly in North Rustical. But, <laughs> uh, and I remember his voice, the way it went out and came back, and, and uh, thinking how special the way his voice was, was amazing. And I remember the first time I heard Catherine singing, I was, uh, I'd heard about her singing and I went up to Babas. And when you started singing, I thought, wow, she has that same thing her dad has. 
you know, I, I'll never forget that. I can tell you in the 50s, when he was 18, 19 years old, and playing for the very first rock and roll audiences in Toronto, <laughs> that the girls loved him. <laughs> he was the sex symbol of the band. Yeah, he had this With little, little sly smile. Uh, leave now. <laughs> some folks scale the mountains high, and some folks sail the seas. Some go into politics or teach philosophy. Some head for the great unknown in search of something new. I don't need that kind of stuff. Just want to be loved by you. Just want to be loved by you. Cause that's the only thing that'll ever do. I've learned how to deal with my depression, and uh, or at least learned to live with it. And, it's like slowly entering a cave. It's really dark and really quiet and really heavy. You know, I, I see a bit of the mania in myself too sometimes and just try to, just try to live within the safe kind of boundaries of that. Hi. Hi. People didn't talk about it, so you didn't talk about it to me even though we were best friends. And you probably didn't really talk about it to anybody. No, and I nobody talked about it with me either. Right. Like, yeah. It wasn't until like I don't know. He took he went to see a, a psychiatrist, I guess, and he took me along for the ride. And mm -hmm. he was like, he told me that I was going to have to be really strong. Like that was. Oh wow. Those were his words. Mm -hmm. And then that was kind of my only tool. <laughs> Going through all of that was like this false sense of strength, which was to just shut down and. Mm -hmm kind of not talk about it because I didn't know I didn't know what it was that right. we were talking about like I really yeah. didn't cryptic very cryptic yeah it just shattered my confidence but it it started another seed in me the one that had so much to communicate but no way to no way to express it and so in the loss and in the heartbreak and the trauma of losing my dad it was the thing that created who I am now. I haven't been saying this in a long time, so I hope my father forgives me for messing up the lyrics in advance. Wanting to go from the darkness to the light, you know, trying to find the way through this crazy world. A lot of his songs were about that. Even just the words to Snowbird sometimes, I realize just how deeply sad and beautiful those words are. And I think they were ignored for decades, really. Everybody thought it was a happy song. If it's snowy mantle cold and clean The unborn grass lies waiting for its gold to turn to green The snowbird sings a song he always sings And it speaks to me of flowers That will bloom again in spring Spread your tiny wings and fly away Take the snow back with you where it came from After the success of Snowbird, I remember Jack McAndrew telling me, he said, Gene came to him one day and he said, look, uh, I'm feeling really guilty, you know, like uh, that song only took me 25 minutes or something to write and I'm making all this money from it. And Jack just looked at him and said, Gene, didn't take you half an hour to write that song, it took you 27 years. <laughs> Here's the rest of us walking around thinking, you know, well, we deserve this. When's this going to happen? <laughs> Where's my Snowbird? Yeah. <laughs> Where's my Anne Marie hit? <laughs> I think what I shared with your father was maybe a, a common disdain for the music industry. Yeah. You're always having to be on mm -hmm. all the time. You're always going to be Gene McClellan, you're going to be Stomping Tom, you're going to be Catherine McClellan. You have to be on for people and stuff, and they expect so much from you, right? Well, yeah. I think he liked to meet people on the same level, like, yeah. and I think most people yeah. do. It's pretty weird when people, yeah. I mean, you must get that. Yeah. Yeah. 
touch me. We were sitting at home and uh, we were watching CMT and the video for Godspeed came on. And yeah. I don't know if I had really heard the song before. I just couldn't believe that somebody out there in the world wrote this song about my dad. For all that time that we flirted with the idea of a co-write, yeah. that, that maybe Godspeed was that. It was a bit of a co-write. Co yeah. yeah, that maybe I got it really fast because he was, uh, you know, the better angel of his nature was sitting on my shoulder. <laughs> Who knows? I like to think that, that it was a mm -hmm. I believe he would understand And for you a sweet soul A desperate deed Godspeed 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 you my heart Hi, Paige. I just thought I'd meet you. Does Paige want to come over? You want to come over? I won't talk about love, love, love anymore. Cause you know that I've said too much already without really being sure. Won't talk about a Holy Ghost revival until it is seeping through my pores. Won't talk about love, love, love anymore. Just mind that. That's good. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah? You like that one? Yeah. Come on in, we'll do a little. Oh, my ears. Did, did, were you ever aware of Dad's depression? Did you guys ever talk of that? I could feel it. No, we never talked about it. I'm, I'm drowning in sorrow, drawing constantly nearer to misery. I'm just biding my time while the glow from the wine makes a fool out of me. Ooh, ooh, that could be said every cup of you so many times, <laughs> but not these days, more disciplined. But I do have a lovely glass of Chardonnay from Argentina. And I, you could have one, I could have one. This old farmhouse, Saturday night, we got the radio on. We're sitting around the kitchen table, probably having a beer. This amazing song came on the radio that's just riveted uh, your dad and I. Starry, starry night, paint your palette blue and gray. Look out on a summer's day with eyes that know the darkness in my soul. You took your life, Vincent, as lovers often do. But I could have told you, Vincent, that the world was never meant for one as beautiful as you. Jean says, after it's done, why do you think it was Van Gogh took his life? I thought about this for a couple of minutes, what seemed like an eternity, and I, I was too young to, to, to shape that answer. I said, Jim, I'm sorry, I don't know. Your dad says, I think it was because of his failure to communicate to people the beauty in life all around them. Profound, buddy. That's why I like hanging out with you every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, man, what a guy. What a guy. 
I think that what he was trying to do was to help himself by helping other people. So his songs don't end sadly. There's always a bit of light in them. I love you for what you are. You don't have to be a superstar. Shining on the silver screen. You're old enough to know when I'm around, love can grow. Forgive yourself and let it go. But your dad was capable of very generous uh, acts of kindness. I seen him take all the insulation out of his garage to give to a, a musician friend that wasn't making any money and needed insulation for his house. He got in his T-Bird, I mean, he had that black T-Bird. He got in the car and drove into Charlottetown and gave me the $150. I just get a warm feeling when I think of him. He was he's just a, a wonderful man. Well, he was a Jesus-like character on earth, man. He was doing, he was doing his best. He was a big reader, you know, he was always reading something that was informing his, his thought and his feelings on what church meant to him and what religion meant to him, what spirituality meant to him. And, um, and maybe this is related to his mental illness, <laughs> or maybe he was just very fervent. But, you know, there were times when he would lock himself away in a small room until he read the Bible from beginning to end. Give me for changing my mind and I'll give you another for being so blind if it's all right with you then it's all right with me but when it's hard to unravel the grass from the gravel I think it's time to be moving to the north country we did this concert in Charlottetown in, on that tour, and he um, he comes and he, he gives Tom and I and him one of these, and that's what we wore that's when we were on the stage. Look at that. Oh yeah. See, you'd play better in this. Yeah. <laughs> you, you keep that, okay? Really? Yeah. Oh, that's so nice. Hi, sweetie. Look at you. Have you ever grown? Come on in. Gosh, look at me. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um. Uh, all my wives loved them. <laughs> they, they said, I'd leave you any day for Gene. <laughs> but he had that effect on anybody. He lift, seemed to lift everybody's spirits. Okay. We're actually recording a, a tribute record to Dad. No kidding? Yeah. So. Oh, that's wonderful. They tried to set him up, having a beautiful girl in the next room, try and tempt him. All the drugs in the world around to try and tempt him. He said, I thought I was unhappy, but all the people that I met there, these big stars, says they were really unhappy. I didn't want to have anything to do with that. I had a chance to be alone in the small hotel that you call home, in a room without a phone. I've been to hell and back again. I've been allowed to feel the pain. What it's like to be insane. He showed up, I was living in Cardigan and uh, had a log cabin there. And I, I had a, a miraculous thing sort of happen where that born again experience happens for people. Yeah. Well, that happened to me in this cabin. All of a sudden, your dad drives down the road now, we hadn't seen each other for maybe six months. He, uh, he hands me this Bible, and I reach into my pocket and bring mine up. <laughs> so now we're on the same wavelength again. We're, wow. Now we're into doing gospel music. He didn't preach to anybody. He just, he just wanted to share something. Yeah. And you have to discover those things for yourself. 
But you gotta hold your peace And brother, you gotta hold your peace And sister, you gotta hold your peace And let the Lord do the fighting for you I don't want to get it wrong or like make him out to be somebody he's not, but I think his greatest struggle was this um, kind of this idea that he wasn't good enough or or that he had to work extra hard because of some buildup of guilt. I have three kids. I have a boy 16, I have a, a girl 14, and another girl 11. For the first time in my life, really, it feels like that. It feels proper. It's almost like uh, I don't want to go to heaven today. <laughs> you know, I'm not ready to go. It's, it feels too nice sometimes. To that land. I think in the last few years, his moods got kind of out of control. They didn't get the medications right at all, and and suddenly he just kind of disappeared from us and was no longer, yeah, he was no longer himself and no longer my dad. And yeah, it was just this really kind of terrible time. And I, I just wish that they had figured that out. The medication, you know, just made it so much worse. I have no idea if Jean ever uh, was um, diagnosed. No, I, I, I don't think that he, he was, because I, I think that if they had known what was really wrong with him, they would have tried different medication that would have actually helped him. I think so too. I mean, I've done a lot of reading, and uh, one thing that is, is for sure is like if you, if you give antidepressants to someone who's bipolar, that it is the worst possible thing for them because it just exacerbates the manic, the manic part, part, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. the manic part. And that's the thing that sometimes drives me crazy about my dad is that my dad was a beautiful human being, but he was also other things. You know, he also had these issues with, you know, paranoia and and uh, you know things that were not positive and and really hurt other people, mostly my mom or probably his other relationships too, so it does bug me, you know, if there's too much. Holy Jean was, you know, an angel, a perfect specimen, it's obviously nobody is. Like some people dwell on uh, mental illness and things like that, uh, and I think if they just uh, settled down, relaxed, and uh, got away and thought about things for a while instead of going on. You know, I think you've got to get away and reflect and find out what the real you is and who he is or who she is. I remember talking to friends just curious, like, what they were going through. <laughs> if they were going through anything, because I didn't really know what was happening with me, but I knew something was not all right. Is this part of your reality too, or am I just, am I really crazy? But most of them said that they were going through something similar too, or that they had, and, and so I never really felt, after that, I never felt afraid to talk about it, and it helped me to begin to deal with it, saying it out loud. I wasn't nervous about it at all until just the last couple of days I had told a few people, you know, everybody was telling me, you know, she's such an icon, legend, and then I started getting really nervous. We met in a little conference room in the CBC building in Halifax, and 
your dad sat there with his guitar and he sang Snowbird. I, he had a tape. So he gave me the tape. He said, oh yeah, do whatever you want with them. Well, I couldn't believe it. And so that's how we first met. I mean, people always uh, say uh, about my dad and maybe about you that that song, specifically Snowbird, changed the arc of your career. And do you feel that way? Well, I didn't even know that I was going to have a career right. <laughs> until Snowbird. And I was just so grateful that he was around and that he was writing these songs <laughs> that were so amazing to me. He was just seemed to be naturally gifted, not only as a songwriter, but as a singer, vocally. Yeah. You listen to him sing. <laughs> I would always be amazed at how he just naturally did all that stuff. And as excited as we would get about the songs that he wrote, any time I tried to praise him or tell him how great he was, he was just, he would go, oh, no, no. It just seemed as if he felt he didn't deserve it. Do you, do you remember at all, like, um any sort of awareness that he might have depression or, or that, those kind of sensitivities? I don't think I ever detected anything like that, but I thought he was humble to a fault. Right, yeah. Well, he was a pretty smart guy, but he didn't know what to do with himself. <laughs> he didn't. Even with all of these conversations that we had, I feel like I know him less, right, in this moment, uh, less than I did before. Part of his downfall was his privacy, you know. If he had been able to talk about his mental health problems, who knows, maybe he'd still be here and he'd be able to protect his privacy. You know, but he didn't, and, and I don't want the cycle to continue of, you know, I don't, I don't want to be the next one in our family to not deal with mental health issues. I think you have to make a decision to be well and, and then to fight for your life. I mean, I think he attempted to do that, but somehow got lost in the struggle. So. I could use you now to guide me somehow. Walk me down that aisle. But I will not be the first to miss giving there's no big thing. There's nothing really left at the end except that I guess I can stop chasing it, you know, or like, or stop holding it away from me because I'm afraid to see that there's nothing there. Yeah, it's not like I don't get a second chance with that. I just get to enjoy what's already there and what already happened, which is enough, you know. It's like, that's more than enough. And some people don't get that much. That's where he is, is he's in the music. And I never feel like he's not there. It means so much to be able to share the music and the stories of my father, Gene McClellan. You just heard If It's All Right With You, and before that was Snowbird, and my dad said that was the second song he ever wrote, which made me wonder, what was the first? Turns out, it was this next song, Pages of Time. If I could bring back the love there was mine If I could roll back the years Through the 
I was 14 when my dad ended things. See, mental illness is not something that people feel very comfortable talking about, let alone suicide. The stigma surrounding mental illness is still so strong, and that silence, that stigma, is the greatest barrier to early detection and treatment. I know with my own depression, the voices in my head are always saying, you're no good, life is too much to bear, and it paralyzes me. But sharing this story with you tonight reminds me that we're not alone. Reminds me that we all have our own voice and our own story, and we need to be brave enough to speak up for ourselves and those around us and to share those stories. If the cry